Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Mad Mom Looks. I'm Mahin and I'm joined by my co-host Sim. On today's show, we have Dr. Ahmed Hanker, who's an associate professor of psychiatry with the Carrick Institute for Graduate Studies, a senior research fellow for the Bedfordshire Center for Mental Health Research and Associates with Cambridge University in the UK, and a mental health clinician with the National Health Service in the UK. And that was a handful. But uh, Ahmed... Um, we we became aware of you a few weeks ago because uh, Noreen, who's Sim's wife, was uh, in D.C. for a mental health conference, and I guess she met you there. Now, she came back. She messaged us. It's like, there's a guy, Dr. Ahmed Hanker, you guys have to meet. You guys have to get him on the podcast because he has an amazing story. And so, uh, first of all, uh, Ahmed, Jazakallah Khair for taking the time out of your schedule to talk to us tonight, to talk to us today. Um and just like tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from and what you're about, because maybe our listeners aren't in, you know familiar with with you. But let's get to know you a little bit. Sure. Um, well, first of all, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Jazakallah khair for inviting me to contribute to your podcast. Um, it's a it's a pleasure. It's a privilege and. Uh, I'm really excited. I've got a good feeling about this. Um, so, alhamdulillah, I had the opportunity to deliver an oral presentation um, at the Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C. Um, that was for the 10th Annual Muslim Mental Health Conference under the auspices of Michigan State University. And my presentation was about uh, breaking down the barriers to accessing and using uh, mental health services. So challenging mental health stigma in the Muslim community. And I'm passionate about raising awareness of the importance of of mental health. And uh, unfortunately, uh, despite the availability of effective treatment, many Muslims with mental health problems continue to suffer in silence. So uh, this is not something that we should be quiet about. Uh, we should be like Malcolm X, who said that it's the hinge that squeaks that gets the grease. So we need to be advocates. And um, Noreen, uh, she delivered an inspirational and powerful uh, piece about her experiences as a relative of someone who experienced uh, mental health problems. And it deeply resonated with me and I just kind of gravitated towards her. And uh, I think as a species, we derive solace from shared experience. So I've been, de- I've been described as uh, an expert by experience. Um, I deliver uh, talks about the, the wounded healer archetype. And so my wounded healer program has been described as an innovative method of pedagogy of uh, an, in- an innovative method of teaching that blends the performing arts with psychiatry. And the uh, argument I'm making is how can you educate an audience if you can't engage them? So what I do is I reenact scenes from films. So uh, one of the opening uh, parts of my performance, and it's less a lecture, more a performance, is I reenact a scene from uh, Pulp Fiction, Ezekiel 2517, the path of the righteous man is beset on all sides by the inequities of the selfish and the tyranny of evil men. Now, blessed is he who, in the name of charity and goodwill, shepherds the weak through the valley of the darkness, for he is truly his brother's keeper and the finder of lost children. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger, those who attempt to poison and destroy my brother. And you will know that I am the Lord with my vengeance upon thee. Now, if that doesn't engage audiences wow. and organize them, I don't know what will. And guess what? There's plenty more of that where I where I, where it came from. That that is awesome. Uh, Pulp Fiction is one of my favorite movies, and you nailed it. You nailed well, it. So so um, you, your your engagement of therapy is um, or is it is it is it therapy that you're you're incorporating these scenes from movies, or is it just in your talks, or, or? well. It's an insight into what I call drama therapy because for me it is therapeutic. It's even cathartic. Um, It's educational um, because I I use that uh, entertainment element 
mm. uh, to engage my audiences. And once they're engaged, I mean, because the Wounded Healer performance has been, Alhamdulillah, I've delivered it to over 60,000 people in 13 countries on five continents worldwide. And it's been integrated into the medical school curriculum of four universities in the UK, the University of Dundee in Scotland, uh, King's College London, Cambridge University, and the University of East Anglia. So what happens is these medical students, they've been subjected to, let's be honest, a day of boring professionalism lectures and they are literally snoring dro drooling saliva <laughs> so I, I i kid you not so i rock up they they have they're like oh no not another boring lecture they have no idea what they are about to be subjected to and then that's when i that's when i start reenacting the scenes that's when i hit them with Ezekiel 2517 and some of the feedback that i'm getting is it's it's so uh rewarding it's so empowering they're saying to me uh hey doc you know uh this is the most inspirational lecture that you've that we've ever experienced so that kind of feedback really does um encourage me there's a fire burning in my belly and there's thunder in my heart for this yeah uh, so ezekiel 2514 and in, in what context are you using that scene in therapy um well i mean reenacting the scene if you think about it i mean it's it's like how does it's, that how does that what kind of person or patient would be receptive to that scene or are you just playing it out just to grab attention? Well, it's not it's not in a clinical context. Okay. This is in a in an educational context. Okay. So this is when I'm lecturing to medical students usually or or physicians. So there's more the kind of for example, I uh, I was invited to deliver uh, a keynote lecture at the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Uh, continuing professional development conference and then after uh, reenacting Ezekiel 2517 one of the participants or delegates uh, tweeted uh, that you know Dr. Hanker reenacts a scene from Pulp Fiction I'm engaged that's the point we're trying to engage people because medical education can be boring how, and, and that's I, I really want to emphasize this point how can you educate an audience if you can't engage them so we have to be innovative we have to pioneer innovative methods of teaching. Right, right. I think as you know, as parents, that's one of the main challenges we have. I know with my daughters, I'm always trying to educate them and try to um, make sure that they don't, uh, you know, give me those glassy-eyed look that you know their mind is somewhere else while I'm talking. And just, I just remember when my dad used to lecture me, my my head was somewhere else and. I would be completely disengaged. So what I started doing was um, pulling out more scenes from my childhood so that I can engage with them more and make them realize like, hey, I know some of the struggles you're experiencing and I can sure. relate to you on that end. But as a therapist, you have to be detached. You're not really, you're, you're, are you, I think in your profession, you're not supposed to be uh, engaging with your patient on that kind of level, are you? Well, to I have to make this very clear um, that when I'm reenacting scenes from films, that tends to be on a stage. Right. Okay. That's that's education. In a clinical context, that would not be professional. Uh, it <laughs> could potentially be damaging. So it's almost like a, a persona. The wounded healer is a persona. Gotcha. Um, whereas... When I see my patients, I tend to do a lot more listening than I do talking, to be honest with you. Oh, I mean, obviously, there's a psychoeducation uh, component uh, to the uh, consultation, but it's usually a lot more listening. Um, so you have to be very clear about that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> are, are you able to... How Are you able to pull any of your experiences through um, your stagecraft into your uh, professional life and how you deal with your patient. Were you able to pull any um, pieces of knowledge that you've, at least maybe through interaction with the audience or uh, other mediums, have you been able to incorporate anything into your practice or, or is that completely still by the book and how they teach you guys in, in uh, medical school? Well, I mean, medical school, I mean, I mean we're essentially taught to conform on you and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not one to conform with the status quo, uh, but at the same time, I'm mindful of 
being in the presence of a vulnerable soul. Um, and my, I have a duty. I'm bound by the Hippocratic oath to do no harm. Um, so in a clinical context, I might say, for example, that there are other options available. Psychotropic medication, sure. Popping some pills. There's a lot of evidence to support the effectiveness and efficacy of taking psychotropic drugs. But there are other options available. And so that's that's when I inform them that, for example, there's art therapy, there's trauma therapy, and they might not know about this. And guess what? Trauma therapy, unlike drugs, doesn't have any side effects. Um, even just even, for example, as part of the wounded healer, I disclose. I'm honest, open, and proud about being a survivor of psychological distress, which was precipitated by the war in Lebanon in 2006, and which rendered me impoverished and homeless. Um, so, I. How old were you back then? Ah, uh, was uh, was that 2006? Hang on, 12 years ago, I was 20. 20, 23 years old, man. 23, wow. So for, for our listeners, I'm actually, even for myself, I'm not familiar with what had happened in Lebanon. Can you sure. kind of like tell us a little bit about the backdrop, the last maybe like yeah. 40 years of what happened? Like what's the context here? Well, I can, I can, what I can do is, you know, I can signpost my journey if you like. Yeah. Sure. So uh, I was born in Belfast and uh, my father, he qualified from Cairo Medical School. He's, he's Lebanese, but he received a scholarship uh, to study medicine in Egypt. Um, now, th I was born in 1982, and this was at the height of the Civil War. And Lebanon was occupied be, by the Israeli uh, Defense Forces. Now, in in that same year, there was the notorious massacres of Palestinians in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. Um, so it was a bloody and brutal civil war, and my father had the opportunity to work in Ireland as a doctor, which is where I was born. And then we uh, we moved to Dublin. Uh, which is the capital of the Republic of Ireland. Then we moved to England. And then when I was 12, <laughs> 1995, you know, parents are getting homesick, you know. So my mother always longed to return and to be reconciled with her family, which is understandable. So we returned. Um, but we, I think we underestimated uh, how far-reaching uh, the uh, consequences of the conflict in 1982 uh, was. Uh, I mean, I remember my father making me up one day saying, uh, you know, son, it breaks my heart to say this to you, but I can't feed you. And you're a father, right? So can you imagine saying that to your children? Can you imagine looking your children in the eyes and saying, I can't feed you? And so he, and I was 17 at the time, I mean, we used to go to sleep on an empty stomach. Well, we, I mean, sometimes the pangs of hunger would keep us up at night. So it's not like we would always go to sleep. Um, so we managed to scrape some money together, and my father purchased a one-way ticket to return to England. Um, and I was reminiscing, uh, maybe romanticizing. I was like, wow, you know, like, I was only away for five years. And those five years in Lebanon had a profound impact on my identity, my formative years. And I think that's when I discovered Islam. And I'm grateful for those years, despite the poverty, despite the conflict, despite the war, uh, despite the sleepless nights. I'm grateful for those years. So I returned. But I think during that absence, I, I did, uh, like I said, romanticize. I thought maybe I said, oh, wow, you know, money grows in trees in the UK, right? It's Great Britain. I got a British passport. You know, I graduated top of the school I attended in Lebanon. I'm going to walk into medical school. That was my expectation. The reality is that they didn't recognize my qualifications in Lebanon. And they said, no, you're not going to go into 
medical school, even if you're a British citizen. You have to be resident here. And if you're not resident here for three years, we don't, that uh, British passport uh, means nothing. You have to pay tu uh, tuition fees for international students. So I had no other option but to take a year out. And uh, during that year, um, I worked as a janitor. I was cleaning floors from you can't see in the morning until you can't see at night. Minimum wage. Calluses on my hands. Testament of the toil of my labor. And this was actually against the backdrop of heightened levels of Islamophobia. Why? Because you may have heard of the London 7-7 bombings. And the perpetrators were from the city that I was living in at the time, Leeds. And so, for example, there would be uh, a passenger in a car. He would roll down the window and he would shout out, Bin Laden! even though I was clean-shaven back then. So, and I was naive. I, I just didn't understand why when I said good morning to someone, they wouldn't say good morning back to me. I was quite uh, gregarious. And so I felt isolated. And not just that, I mean, the, the world does such a good job um, trying to convince you that you'll never amount to anything in life. Like, for example, right, I finished that first year, 70 hours a week. Minimum wage, right? Far removed from my family. I couldn't derive comfort from their immediate presence. But I had my prayers. And you take care of your prayers, your prayers will take care of you. And my mother was praying for me. And God was protecting me with his angels. And the following year, I was like, right, I'm going to enroll into pre-med. So I go to pre-med, right? And I speak to the head of the sixth form, the head of pre-med. And she, said, she laughs at my face. She goes, you're not going to get into medical school. You know what she made me feel like? Like I'm some kind of uh, talentless uh, asylum seeker with delusions of grandeur. But I had a vision, and I had the ability to execute that vision. But I continued to work full time because I was completely independent. I was actually pro supporting my mother financially at the time. 50 hours a week working and also studying. And I remember whenever I would walk in the opposite direction of the head of this pre-med school her pride was palpable to the extent that my gaze would be fixed to the floor and her chin would be raised um, but then on the day that the results of the exams were announced there was role reversal this head of the pre-med school had her gaze fixed to the ground and I was Astonished. And this is a proud person. And alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah, despite being in full-time employment, for one of my exams, I got 100 out of 100. And that was uh, a message of intent. And when I said that I want to uh, get into medical school and realize my dream of qualifying as a doctor one day, I meant it. And we have to do everything that's humanly possible and put our faith on Allah. So I matriculated into medical school, um, and people just gravitated towards me. You know, I was working out every day. I was running. Healthy body is a healthy mind. Um, I was described as the most popular uh, person in medical school. I was the one. I was the type of guy that people would either love or loathe. And gradually, I deviated from that path of righteousness, the sirat al-mustaqim, because the dunya, the world, seduced me, and I wasn't even aware of it. That's what happens when with the khutrat al-shaytan. It's so kind of subtle. You're not aware of it. And then one day you wake up, you behold your reflection in the mirror, and you become unrecognizable to yourself. Like, what happened? You know, my, my soul has been contaminated by shaytan. And that realization can be so overwhelming. Uh, it can precipitate an episode of psychological distress uh, just by itself. So then the people I associated myself with, they were not Muslim. And then I kind of gradually distanced myself from them. I wasn't antisocial or hostile, but when I started to focus more on my studies, and I was studying 12 hours a day, I'd be walking and I'd be reading a medical textbook. I think maybe uh, they started to, uh, they started to uh, be jealous. And so I was... It felt like um, they were trying to sabotage me, these people. So the realization of how far away from the path of righteousness I deviated from 
this kind of uh, uh, exclusion from the people who I thought were my friends. And then waking up one morning to discover that Lebanon was bombed and that hundreds of people were killed overnight and trying to get through to my family um, because they bombed the part of Lebanon that my family live in. Unbeknown to me at the time that the British government evacuated my family. I thought they were dead. You would see pictures of buildings that were reduced to rubble. You would see disemboweled, decapitated babies. And that was my reality. And sometimes an appropriate response to reality is to go insane. And then I was forced to interrupt my studies. And my only source of income was from the student loans company. But because I was no longer a student, the medical school said the war in Lebanon is not mitigating circumstances. I, w I was rendered impoverished and homeless. Um, and yeah, in extremis, I developed a suicidal ideation. You put someone who has uh, hay fever in a field and you say to that person, don't uh, sneeze, don't uh, develop a rash, don't itch. That, it's like saying to someone who has a vulnerability to psychological distress or depressive illness, don't develop suicidal ideation. These people are ignorant. That's why we have to educate people. You have to improve mental health literacy in the Muslim community because a lot of people say, oh, this person's faith is weak because he had suicidal ideation. That's not true. And it was during this moment, actually, I was reading the biography of uh, Muhammad, uh, man and prophet Muhammad by Adil Salihi, and they were describing the battle of Uhud and how Utbah was the hero of that day because the Muslims, uh, they suffered substantial uh, losses and even the Prophet Muhammad sustained an injury. But Utbah was using his body as a human shield. I remember actually reenacting or trying to imagine what that must have been like. The Prophet Muhammad all he was trying to do was deliver this message of peace to humankind. He wanted to rescue them. And yet the Quraysh wanted to kill him. And I remember being so upset about that and crying. And then Allah planted the seed of Sakina in my heart and my mind. And despite being impoverished, despite being rendered homeless, despite being ostracized, uh, despite having to interrupt my studies, I had this big smile on my face. And that's what happens when you remember Allah. What happened to Faroon's wife when he was torturing her to death? When she remembered Allah, she smiled. So even in those moments of extreme hardship, uh, you, Allah will intervene if you remember him, if you turn to him, and he'll plant the seeds of Sakina in your mind in your heart and mind. So anyway, I, I gradually recovered. You know, I got back on track. It was a gradual process. And then Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I qualified from medical school, started working as a doctor. And uh, I had this, as I said, uh, this fire burning in my belly and this thunder in my heart. I had to realize my potential. And uh, that very year, uh, I received the uh, 2013 Royal College of Psychiatrists Doctor of the Year Award, which marks the highest level of achievement in psychiatry in the UK. And so what I do now is I, I give talks about my, my journey, because if I can recover and uh, realize my potential, and not just realize my potential, but excel at what I do, be it the best at what I do, other people out there, other Muslims out there, who experience psychological distress can also recover and is giving them that hope because when you're at the throes of mental illness you might have you might be hopeless you might think you'll never recover and tragically uh, you might even be compelled to end that which is most precious human life itself so we've got to give that message of hope that recovery is not only possible it's probable actually now um what kind of psychological duress are you talking about? Because a lot of people who you know, experience mental illness, there's usually, uh, you know, chemical related. That's the, at least that's sure. the association, right? That, you know, you go to a psychiatrist for um, things that are uh, chemical imbalances that are occurring within uh, the mind. And how are you able to relate to patients through your own duress? Well, I mean, because it doesn't sound, I, it sounds like you had like a, a post traumatic stress um, type of yeah, a syndrome, so right? I, I tend to refrain from using uh, psychiatric or diagnostic 
uh, labels. Because I think that when you say to someone, I've got schizophrenia, when you say to someone, I've got bipolar disorder, they've got preconceptions. So I don't find it very helpful. I mean, don't get me wrong, those labels can be helpful sometimes. But what I like to do is I like to describe what I was experiencing. I was experiencing oscillations in my emotion, oscillations in mood. My mood would go up. I would be elated. I would be euphoric. I would be manic. And when I'm manic, I get increased energy, racing thoughts, reduced need for sleep. But when I'm down, when I'm dysphoric, when I'm depressed, I feel low. I don't have any energy. Any energy. Uh, there's no joy in my life. Um, so I, that's why I, I like to describe what I was experiencing as opposed to uh, using these kind of labels. And so what I start off with is just the term psychological distress. And the people tend to be a bit more inquisitive as opposed to um, just coming to conclusions. Well, I know there's like a lot of people like me who are trying to understand uh, psychological duress the way you're explaining it, right? Like, you know, the highs yeah. and the lows. And some people... I've heard explain it away saying that, you know, those type of people just, they're not engaged enough in their life. So they end up going on these lows. So if they had some level of engagement with society or some greater purpose that they were, um, you know, getting fulfilled with, they would, they wouldn't experience that, that low that, that you're talking about, at least yeah. in your experience. So all due respect to these people, what's driving them to say that is ignorance. Because would they say the same things about people who develop physical health problems? In the same way that people develop mental health problems, people develop physical health problems. And, you know, I didn't go to medical school for nothing. You know, I didn't train in academic psychiatry for nothing. There's knowledge out there. You have to acquire the knowledge. You have to be uh, qualified before you make uh, statements like that. So these people need to be informed. And, so so how, how did facts, you get out of that rut? Well, I mean, I... I used the power of performing arts. I used the power of prayer, right. uh, exercise. So I run 10 to 15 kilometers every day. A healthy body is a healthy mind. Uh, well, well, that's what the argument is that a lot of people are saying that, that these people kind of uh, are stagnant in terms of uh, their participation with the, with the world. Like they're not, just like you said, they're not exercising. They're not... Um, they're not taking part in in activities that are you know engaging to them and they're kind of shutting down their mind and a uh, certain type of I, I don't know uh, the, the, these certain receptors in their brain aren't getting activated and releasing you know endorphins or, or dopamine let's just say well okay I mean there are I mean there are protective factors and there are risk factors and you can you can argue that exercise faith, um, these are protective factors, but there are also risk factors as well. So I'm not naive now uh, in the sense that I know how I'm going to react if there's going to be a conflict. So I need to have measures in place. I need to make sure that there's a support network. Whereas initially I was in denial. I was like, you know what? That happens to other people. It doesn't happen to me. And I think that would be a risk factor because there are people out there who say that would never happen to me. So you might... Um, you might exercise, you might have structure, you might have purpose in your life, but if there's some kind of a stressful uh, event that could be being rendered uh, uh, unemployed, it could be uh, marital disharmony, divorce, it could be a war. Yeah, um, and, and Ahmed, I, if, if I can interject, because you just brought up an important point. Um, when I lost my job, I lost it for you know six months to a year, a very long period of time I was unemployed. I felt yeah. those same experiences, those, you know, that those lows in my life where yeah. you question everything that you understood and, you know, you go into dark places that, that you never thought yeah. you would ever explore, you know? So uh, <clears throat> I think one of the main things was getting out of that rut was, you know, that type, that level of engagement that you take, um, you know, working out and, uh, meeting people and staying positive. And I think if, if we can kind of, I, I think there's a lot more people are that are suffering from this than they would like to admit. And yeah. if we can get 
people to discuss this a little bit more and, you know, just come out like you said, you know, with your story. Well, I think what you're talking about is resilience. Right. You know? I think we need to prevent and have these protective factors in the same way that you might want to um, exercise the body. You can argue you can exercise the mind uh, and make your mind stronger. And I think that we have to be honest, open and proud about this. I mean, it's not in my place to impose my views on anyone. But if you if you look at the data, I mean, the, the world authority on mental health stigma is actually based in Chicago and the Illinois Institute of Technology. You may have heard of him before, right. Professor Patrick Corrigan. And Patrick Corrigan conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis. That's the highest level of evidence on challenging public stigma. And he concluded that the most effective way of breaking down stigma is when you make social contact with somebody who's recovered from mental illness. In other words, it's the people, the survivors, the consumers, the experts by experience who have recovered from mental health problems who have the power to reduce the stigma associated with it. And he argues that these psychiatrists, you know what, they need to take a back seat. And it's these service users or patients or people who have recovered from mental health problems who, who need to operate at the vanguard. Right. Like, for example, you know, you know Prince Harry, right? Right. So he's he's like getting married to Meghan Markle, right? And I know that you Americans love the royal family. I don't know about you, but generally speaking, the Americans love the royal family. There is definitely a fascination with the royal family. So Prince Harry has an interview, and he is honest, open, and proud about his mental health issues, which was triggered by the death of his mother, Princess Diana. And guess what? Mental health charities reported that there was a surge in the number of people who contacted them. There's like a 38% increase. And I think that reveals that by being honest, open, and proud, we can reduce the stigma attached to mental health problems and people will start to seek help. Yeah. And seeking help is a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness. You don't have to punish yourself. You know, Effective right. treatment is available. Life is for living. Right, and it's right. to say that with conviction. Have, have you explored um, the effects that social media is having on a lot of people um in, in in modern society in terms of the amount of you know negative news um, fear mongering and you know that i think it's raising a lot of people's cortisol levels to dangerous levels if if they can um i think there was a recent study actually done that studied a, a very large group of participants who just cut out facebook for three days and their cortisol levels dropped significantly have yeah. you looked into this at all? Well, it's not my area of expertise, uh, cyber bullying, cyber crime. I mean, we know it's that. Not, not cyber crime. We're talking about like negative news. I mean, problems in the world, famine approaching, the polar ice caps are melting, Russia and yeah. America well, and China are engaged in a trade war, and, you know, well, uh, Donald Trump is going to kill all the Muslims and send them off into foreign lands. And this is creating a danger, like dangerous levels of anxiety among. Yeah. At least yeah. Muslims, I know. But it's a source of negativity, isn't it? And, that, and yeah. that negativity can come in many forms. It could be Islamophobic rhetoric, you know. It could be the doom and gloom of uh, the, you know, the current political landscape. And um, it could be bullying or, 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 or there are other, you know, different types of negativity. And certainly, social media can be a source of that. And yes, I, I know. I think I know for sure that with uh, teenagers, uh, children, and adolescents that there is an association between the consumption of social media and uh, anxiety, psychological distress, suicidal ideation, suicidal behavior. Um, unfortunately, it can be quite addictive. And so they might initially experience what you could uh, describe as withdrawal symptoms. Right. But that will eventually abate. Right. And I think the best outcomes, actually, there are certain schools actually ban uh, bringing your devices uh, to uh, school altogether because it can be a distraction oh yeah um, so i think yeah it, it is quite worrying yeah uh, it, it because i know with my own daughters i've now we've just instated a rule that you know after a certain time in the evening they have to turn in all the electronic devices put it in our bedroom and they can't touch yeah. it and they have to go to sleep so uh, i mean every parent has to figure out what's right for them i can't tell them that that this is works uh, best for everyone uh, in certain families it's best not to have any um you know tablets or phones or anything so this is what works for sims family but i'm i want to explore a little bit about 
you, you know, your, your work with Islamophobia that you're, you know, uh, working on right now. And, um, yeah. you know, we had a anxiety uh, inducing event that just passed by. Uh, what was it? Heard in Punisher Central, Muslim Pun- Day? Punisher Muslim Day. I think it originated <laughs> in the UK, didn't it? It did originate yeah, in the yeah. UK, but did, everyone did, in America did. was scared. Like literally everyone, not, I don't think, did any event actually happen? No, I, think, I see. I only heard about it through social media, to be honest. So it's like, if you're not even on social media, then right. you, it probably, you wouldn't even recognize it. <laughs> did you, so well, oh, what are your thoughts on that? Like the, these type of, you know, it, it, when we found out about it, I wanted to do a podcast talking about it in terms of telling people to calm down, but I just didn't want to feed into the fire and create uh, more hysteria about it than there actually is. Sure. I mean, the thing is, in the UK, I don't know about the US, but generally people just don't really want to talk about religion. You know, it can be quite intense. It can be quite loaded. Um, now, the Punish the Muslim uh, <coughs> excuse me, campaign uh, originated in the UK. That's correct. It's uh, it's vulgar, it's it's uh, vile, it's vitriolic, um, and uh, for anyone who doesn't know it know about it, I would recommend watching a, uh, an interview that Trevor Noah had with Hassan Minhaj, and they describe the kind of point system they have, like twenty thousand points if you nuke Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's quite it's quite uh, ludicrous actually. I mean, not like I mean, who has access to nuclear weapons, for example? So, um, but. The response to that, and uh, I, I used to be uh, chair of uh, charity, um, the working group in Leeds. Uh, it's called Muslim Engagement and Development, and we're a grassroots organization that challenges Islamophobia, and we uh, encourage and empower Muslims to engage in politics and the media. And in response to that, we had a Love a Muslim a day, um, and we received very positive uh, media coverage uh, uh, the Guardian uh, wrote about our campaign. Um, and Bertrand Russell, uh, the British philosopher, said that love is wise and, and, and hatred is foolish. And, you know, the solidarity that we that we received um, as part of that um, Love a Muslim campaign was was beautiful. Now, what was I was actually in London at the time, and uh, our our mayor, the mayor of London is Salih Khan. Um, and he actually, there was an increased police presence because I think actually they they actually targeted in the letter they targeted Salah Khan, um, so he's he's a powerful man. Um, he's for example he's, uh, he's actually engaged in uh, he's been quite defiant towards yeah. the current uh, statesman uh, head of state in, in in the U.S. But yeah, so Islamophobia it's on the rise. Unfortunately, is it exaggerated? Uh, because I feel it's exaggerated. I th- I think well I mean obviously segments of the media. I feel like ninety nine percent of people are very good people, and I think Islamophobia is kind of now being used as a cop out with a lot of Muslims uh, in terms of um, their failure in whatever they want to achieve. They they're trying to blame other people uh, for their stereotypes when they really should have worked a little bit harder for what they wanted. And yeah. I, I think um, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I, I'm for sure. 100% believe that there are really victims of um, violence towards, you know, whether it's uh, racism or Islamophobia. I'm not, you know, one of these crazy alt-right people who say that this doesn't exist and it's just a made-up phenomena. No, it, it definitely does exist and it has many different forms of it, but I think it's uh, exaggerated, at least in, the, in terms of violence. It's exaggerated and uh, in that context, I think it's causing more harm to our psychology as Muslims who are being raised in the West to achieve our truest potential, you know? Uh, so I, th- I think yeah. well, we're giving our, our youth excuses that they necessarily don't need to explore. Like, these aren't really something... I mean, can they get... You know, hurt by uh, Islamophobic violence. I think they can, but what what I'm trying to say is that this not it shouldn't be on their radar. It forces us to operate from a paradigm of fear, which we should never kind of you know do the first place. Another thing, though, is if you think about like the the big heads of the Islamophobic industry in America, Pamela Geller, Robert Spencer, 
the average person, the average American knows they're lunatics anyways. Like, no one takes them yeah. seriously. You know what I mean? It's like you've got some – so they're so out there. That, yeah, like in the UK, there's Tommy Robinson, right? Right. Is that his name? Yeah. Tommy Robinson's yeah. your guy, right? Yeah, we have Pamela yeah. Geller. Yes. Yeah, um, well, I think it's – I think the points you're making are valid, and it's important not to victimize ourselves um, and the the show of solidarity, um, as, as I said, um, reveals – uh, that actually we have uh, a lot of support. Um, obviously, I mean, uh, I mean, like London media. has a Muslim mayor. How, like, how is that yeah. possible? Like, That's you know, it... <laughs> that speaks volumes. But I mean, people, I've heard people say that the best place, uh, the best country in the West to be a Muslim is the UK. I was, I was, for example, I was in a, in a Uber taxi, and the brother from Somalia. He says to me, you know, in Mogadishu, we can't pray uh, Friday prayers in the mosque because if we do the congregation, it makes us vulnerable to right. attacks. Whereas in the UK, I can go to the mosque whenever I want and I don't have to fear for my own safety. So we need to hear stories about that. So I, I agree. I think we should not uh, victimize ourselves. No, I mean, we're, we're creating uh -huh. a, a, a hysteria, especially among the immigrant communities where – People are abandoning their homes and going back to their old country. And I think people don't realize, at least Muslims who are, you know, second generation Muslims in this country, when they're trying to use labels of Islamophobia for their political gains, you know, they're creating hysteria among people who are new to this country. They just want to settle down. All they're really worried about is the safety of their family and, the, you know, making, uh, earning an honest living and having their kids go to school, and that's it. And then there, here come, you know, X Y Z organization trying to, you know, blow Islamophobia out of proportion. When, when you go out and meet, you know, Americans or, or British people, everyone is is very friendly. And there's going to be, you know, that point zero one percent who, you know, you you always have to be vigilant vigilant about, and you have to be careful. And I think some of our uh, some of this Islamophobia has been hijacked by organizations who want to politicize it and try to want to garner favor. Well, I mean, I think extremists want to cause division. I mean, I was invited to because I've also pioneered an anti-Islamophobia presentation, which I delivered in Orlando after Omar Mateen perpetrated that heinous and horrific terror attack. And there was a spike in anti-Muslim uh, hate crime but my presentation was received uh, with a standing ovation from people across the political spectrum Trump and non-Trump supporters alike and the following day was Super Bowl actually and one of the uh, delegates just sat next to me and started pouring his heart out and he embraced me and he kissed me on my forehead and I was deeply touched by that so I think um that for me was unforgettable uh, because there are perceptions, aren't there? You might think, oh, no, everyone in the U.S., uh, you know, there's this executive order banning Muslim uh, people from seven Muslim majority countries from entering the U.S. So the, there might be that perception that the U.S. hates Muslims. Well, actually, no, you go there and you meet Americans, non-Muslims, who will hug you and who will embrace you and who will kiss you and who will say, I love you. Um, I think we need to raise awareness uh, of that. Uh, so I think you're making a very uh, important point. I, I mean, we and, we were literally, the Mad Bum Lukes were the only organization after Trump got elected as president that we are the ones who were assuring Muslims in America that, hey, nothing's going to happen. You don't have to move to Canada. You don't have to move to any other country. And your life is going to be miserable if you do. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> red, white, yeah. and blue, we love it over here. Don't you forget it. You I know? love it. I can't so, wait to go back. Exactly. Back so, uh, I mean, look, you know, I'm exaggerating, but of course, you know, uh, we, we love our home countries as well. I, I feel um, a, a certain amount of love for for my uh, parents' country, uh, India. And I know Mahin hates Bangladesh, but he, he <laughs> I'm sure... I'm sure he has a soft spot for Bangladesh in his heart I, as well. I, it's because I got a fishbone stuck in my tongue when I was in fifth grade. 
there you go. So that's understandable. <laughs> so well, what what I'm just trying to say is how now now you you went out to uh, Orlando after Omar Mateen's thing. Now Omar Mateen's thing wasn't even Islamic related. It, it, they oh, were, it was really stretched. I mean they they it was really a guy who was conflicted in his sexuality and he you know he he like lashed out in his own yeah his Right, his identity, and he he took it out on people. So, h- how did you approach that that subject when you, when you got a standing well, ovation? Yeah, I mean, we we know like with the British intelligence services, for example, the MI5, and they conducted sophisticated, in depth uh, analyses of of hundreds of uh, people engaged in violent extremism, radicalization, terrorism, and they concluded that actually religion. Could be a protective factor, um, a well-established religious identity. So if you look at the the evidence, and I think that's what we have to do. You have to be dispassionate and establish the facts and look at the evidence. And it's very clear that this has got nothing to do with Islam. Unfortunately, um, segments of the media can perpetuate myths. Um, it's sensational, isn't it? And obviously the rhetoric as well. Um, so and then fear is uh, fear is a way to control people, influence their perceptions. Um, so no, I, I, I wouldn't be very clear about this. If you just look at this subjectively, um, actually the majority of people who are at the receiving end of terrorism are Muslims. And the majority of uh, people who are combating terrorism are Muslims. These are the facts. Exactly. You know, people need to know about this, you know. And I mean, uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he approached the, uh, the Christians and he had a covenant with them, he said that the Muslims will fight on behalf of the Christians. The Muslims will protect the Christians. So, uh, you know, we are leading the way. We should be leaders of countering violent extremism. Um, we should be. That's the example of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, and you mean countering violent extremism. Not as, CVE. Not CVE, the program that the government is trying to instate on and uh, trying to get Muslim organizations to join. Mm. I think in the UK it's called. Uh, what's it called in the UK? I forget. Oh my God! Oh, prevent. 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 Yeah. Yes. Well, oh. I mean, uh, reputable organizations such as the Royal College of Psychiatrists are concerned that prevent can uh, treat Muslims as if they are a suspect community, right. um, and they've been critical. Uh, and these are non-Muslims, and as I said, these are reputable organizations. Um, so uh, we need to develop an, an alternative approach because I think the current approach is is demonizing Muslims and if anything, radicalization is is continuing to rise. Actually, the, the leader of the opposition party, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, he controversially linked foreign policy with uh, with with terrorism. Oh, uh, yes. I mean, I'm just saying, if you're gonna have military operations in most of the majority of countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, and you kill tens of thousands of civilians, women, and children, then it would be naive to think that there would be no consequences to that. Not that we condone terrorism. Of course not. Of course. We condemn it. And we have to be very clear about that. We condemn uh, terrorism. You kill one human being, kill the whole of humankind. That's from the Holy Quran. But I think military operations in most of the majority of countries um, may, might very well be a factor, but you know we speak to the experts regarding that. So, um, what, what's Lebanon like now? Now, uh, I know like ISIS has what? kind of uh, been pushed away, but I think uh, there's still remnants who are trying to influence uh, certain neighborhoods in in uh, Lebanon. I think they're they're trying to feed into some sectarian violence as well. Uh, what's the latest news? I remember seeing a piece on Vice uh, a year or so ago on s- some of the effects that uh, the neighboring war in Syria is having on Lebanon. Yeah, well, we have like uh, um, an influx. So one one in four people in Lebanon is Syrian. Um, and we're really kind of uh, bursting at the seams in terms of uh, providing these people with health care and social care and Many of these people living in refugee camps and squalid conditions, and which are conducive conducive of contagion and psychopathology. Um, but as far as the threat uh, posed by uh, Daesh, 
um, my family lived there, and um, they haven't reported to me that uh, they feel like they have to uh, be mindful um, of any kind of imminent uh, attack uh, by Daesh. I think, fortunately, Lebanon is one of the better countries to live in uh, that part of the world. Obviously, Iraq and Syria is very different in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Why do you think but it's Lebanon, uh, thank yeah. God, why do you think it is that way? Uh, stable. Yeah, how how is it that Lebanon has been so stable? I mean, that is what I'd like to know. I mean, yeah. I'm not a <coughs> I'm not a um, very well versed when it comes to politics. Yeah, um, we've had our fair share of conflict. Don't get me wrong, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's something that does astonish me. Yeah. How it's remained. I mean, even with you know Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah declaring his allegiance with. Uh, the Assad uh, regime. Um, it's yeah, it, I think it's quite extraordinary, uh, and I hope that it uh, it will continue and that it doesn't escalate. When I was uh, when I was growing up in learned, college, a lesson. Yeah, sorry. Right. No, when I when I was growing up, um, I had a good friend in college who whose wife, uh, you know, she grew up in the civil war in Lebanon and. Yeah. He would he would tell me a lot about the PTSD that she was she would experience. I mean, she would uh, wake up screaming in the middle of the night and all kinds of episodes that she would be experiencing. Do you do you uh, deal with a lot of patients that are experiencing PT, PTSD or or post traumatic stress in in uh, from uh, refugees or uh, people immigrants who may have come from war torn countries? Well, I don't see many immigrants. Uh, in the UK, but when I'm in Lebanon and my father has a clinic, my father's an obstetrician, um, and uh, he they they call my father Hakim al Shab, the people's doctor, because he refuses to take money from the poor, and many of his patients are Palestinian and Syrian refugees, and you you know you 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 see the state that some of them are in, um, and. It's 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 really shocking, actually. It's it, it's it's heartbreaking. Um, now, a lot of these people are actually lacking insight. Don't forget, there's a there's a huge stigma attached to mental health problems um, in the Arab world, the Islamic world, um, and and how it manifests. They might, for example, say, "I've got chest pain," um, and that might be a what we call a somatic symptom of anxiety, for example, or or, or they might say that they were possessed by jinn, or they might attribute their uh, experiences to supernatural causes. Um, so there are real barriers. I mean, we, we conducted a study that was published in The Lancet recently, uh, barriers uh, to receiving uh, care for mental health problems for Palestine people in Jordan. Mm. Um, and the, the major barriers that we identified were uh, stigma, financial, uh, cultural, religious. Um, so these people are unfortunately uh, are suffering in silence. So, so how do you stop a, a, a patient, uh, a patient who is saying that they have a jinn possessing them? How do you convince them that they don't and that they actually need uh, treatment? So, I mean, for we we conducted our group in Cambridge in the UK uh, conducted the first intervention study challenging mental health stigma. Stigma is a, an umbrella term that can be deconstructed into three main components. Problems of knowledge, ignorance, problems of attitude, prejudice, and problems of behavior, discrimination. So with ignorance, we educate. Um, and so what we did is we organized this Muslim mental health conference. Uh, the program was comprised of uh, an expert in Islamic sciences, uh, an expert in mental health, and an expert by experience, a Muslim who recovered from mental health problems. And after the exposure to that program, what we did was we, admi we administered uh, validated uh, psychometric instruments that would measure uh, mental health literacy uh, before and after exposure uh, to the program. And the, don't forget that these instruments take into consideration the explanatory models that Muslims formulate, such as supernatural causes for behavioral and psychological disturbances. And so we found that actually education, not just education, but contact when they met a Muslim. So my my response would be that if you had a Muslim who recovered from mental health problems, who spoke directly to that Muslim, who holds that belief, 
that uh, their uh, psychological and behavioral disturbances are attributable to supernatural causes, then I think that will be an effective way of deconstructing and reformulating um, their explanatory models, and they might start to seek help. Mm. Yeah. Back to Lebanon, I wanted to talk, you know, you were there for like, what, five years, right? Lebanon, isn't it like, it has a pretty significant Christian minority, correct? You know how many Romeo and Juliet stories there are over there? You know, like uh, uh, Christian, no, was it Muslim? Yeah, Muslim lady falls in love with a Christian man. Oh, yeah. You know, it's not supposed to happen, right? Right, right. Oh, halal. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of Christians in well, what's the percentage of was it like it was like six seventy thirty or something something like that? Well, I'd say about I think it's, I think it's about forty percent. Forty percent Christian, okay. Like I was wondering I if that you think that's an like you mentioned about the stability there, and I wonder if it's because when you're like living with a, another group of people like that, you know, side by side, if it helps, if there's some well, kind of impact. I mean, not in not in the eighties. In the eighties, the Christians were the Falange. They were the ones who massacred. The, because the Palestinians, uh, they arrived, and then there uh, there was an increase in the. Uh, my understanding was that the Muslim population increased in Lebanon. I think they felt threatened by that. So I think my hypothesis is that look, we've been through a war. We know what the outcome is. You know, uh, there are no winners in 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 a war. You know, and I I I like to think that they've learned from history. You know, that let's just come on, guys. You know, let's put our differences to to one side, um, and let's try to live in peace in peaceful coexistence. I like to think that's uh, the the reason why uh, Lebanon is relatively stable at the moment. Um, I, I I could put you in touch with my sister. Actually, she uh, she did a she studied at the American University of Beirut, a Middle yeah. Eastern studies, and she went to. Columbia University in NYC to study journalism, and she knows all about the political situation in Lebanon. So, yeah, it's just, if you want it's, some it's, it's, more yeah, information about that, I can connect you with her. Yeah, I, I know what Mahin is thinking as well because you think about all the different um, ethnicities or, or you know Chris, Christians, and you have Sunnis, and then you have large Shia population, and you think that's like a recipe for disaster, and then they have this, you know, uneasy peace kind of happening over there. So it's, it's interesting. I'd like to explore that with somebody who's, uh, you know, very familiar with Lebanon. But, uh, the other thing about Lebanon though, is like, you always hear about, um, from like Muslim, it's always perceived by like the religious crew as a place of like fitna. Yeah. As far as like, <laughs> you know, he's like Lebanese women are the most beautiful women in the, by, by Ijma, by consensus. Lebanese women are the most beautiful women in the in the Ummah. I, I spoke to a sister, right? There's a doctor who was revered as a hero. You know, he left Afghanistan when he was 15. He came to the UK, spoke only a few words of English. Um, he uh, Then he uh, was made an offer to study medicine in Cambridge University, which allegedly is one of the best universities in the world. He qualifies, and now he's... Uh, established some kind of health partnership between hospitals in the UK and hospitals in, in Afghanistan. And guess what? His mother is, his sorry, not his mother, sorry, I beg your pardon. His wife is a model. I'm like, oh, wow, how beautiful she is. No, that's not beautiful, man. That's not beautiful, man. Beautiful, my brother, is a sister who wears a headscarf, man. Beautiful is a lady who preserves her modesty, right? So you go there, and people who have weak iman, they might say, oh, yeah, temptation is ubiquitous. Okay, and yeah, sure, there is a reputation, delicious food, beautiful woman, but I think it depends very much on the well, you know, a cliche that one may be, man, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and maybe when my faith was weaker, I would be distracted uh, by what I initially perceived to be beautiful, but then as you mature and you know, when you pray to Allah uh, so that your heart and your mind opens up to receive His revelation and truly fathom um, what beautiful is. Uh, then I think that that's the truth. Yeah, I can relate. I remember because in high school I was only interested in white girls, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then like well, that, I remember in college, happens. yeah. So in college, I remember then it was like then I was I was a single, but I was like then I got religious. Like, I'm only like I'm only interested in like I, I don't even find like there's in retrospect you, you look back now like there's a lot of like good looking like you know you know non-Muslims on campus, right? 
Uh, I'm trying to say non-Muslim because some of our listeners are <laughs> upset with me for saying kufar too much. But anyways, um, so, you know, and the thing is, I was like, and I was telling my friend, my friend was also Muslim, but he was like less practicing. And I was like, and I told him straight up, like, I don't, these not Muslim girls can't do nothing for me. Like, I don't know, what, I don't see what you see with them. And he's like, I don't know what you don't see. You know what I mean? But like, so I agree with your, pers- you, like your, the level of iman you have, and and iman we know fluctuates, right? Uh, sometimes because you know sometimes you feel more spiritual, and if you like, you can get to the gutter. Like you talked about earlier, how when you were like in medical, well, the do you how you were you had a spiritual awakening, but then you fell back into the dunya. You're a popular like student amongst your class and stuff, right? So yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's all. And we it, have to protect ourselves from that. We can't right. be naive to that. No, mm-hmm. you have to be able to know how to deal with the attention. Don't seek it. Yeah. Uh, for the wrong reasons, you know. But we're weak. The Allah created us weak, you know. And then our manufacturer gave us a manual, and that mm-hmm. manual is the Quran, and we must seek instruction from that manual. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, Ahmed, uh, there's something I want to like. As kind of as we wrap up here, there's something I. You talked a little bit about in the beginning, and then we talked about some other stuff. Um, you talked about a lot about, you know, how y- your physical fitness. Um, yeah. On top of and y- your accomplishments are pretty, seems like, mashallah, pretty hefty. Um, and I was listening to a podcast the other day with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Anthony Gustin. Uh, it was on a fitness podcast, um, and he was talking about how – you know, he treats food like fuel. Like you, you can treat. We, you, generally, people treat food two different ways: either as fuel, <laughs> as like a, an, as as an energy source, or as pleasure. And typically, yeah. if we treat it like pleasure, like primarily, we end up like unhealthy. Just let's be honest with you. It's just like the way things happen to be. And if we treat it like fuel, and so he. This guy owns like he's a doctor of like and he and he's like has like a bunch of businesses and he has a podcast and he's writing and he's like there's no way I could eat like crap and get this stuff done like I have to do this because the way and he follows like like for example he follows a ketogenic diet um a little modified ketogenic diet so he's thinking about food from and he does it because of the brain optimal up to, uh, the, the the optimal function that offers the brain right. <laughs> So yeah. talk to you a little bit about your own personal practice um, of yeah. how you inc- – because, you know, as Muslims, man, we, we, we have pretty horrible diets, <laughs> like in we general, do, right? Do. So and talk about that. that. Give us some advice on that. that. Uh, yeah, I, I, th- I think something. it's a world condition, though. I don't think it's a Muslim condition per se. I think everyone in the living in the West is just – Eating terrible. I, true, American has American has we have, we have, we have called sad sad American diet, but most of it's like you know Daisy's we have the biryani and like the like all the all the, the you know refined bread and whatnot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I used to be morbidly obese. Are you kidding? Seriously? Wow, you're s- yeah. What? After my after my after my breakdown, I was 105 kilograms, and then. And then I was determined. I gotta see. To, I, I, I had to converge on that. Yeah, that's like three hundred, right? I have a paper. I have a paper published in the British Medical Journal, and it's called "Should Ramadan Be Prescribed After Christmas?" Why? Because anecdotally, you think you put weight on during Christmas, and you might lose weight if you fast. So that contains my story. Now, um, the the first few lines of my paper are uh, a quote from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the most evil vessel that you can fill is your stomach. A few mouthfuls of food will suffice. But if you must eat more, then uh, fill one-third with food, one-third with water, and leave one-third empty for easy breathing. So personally, I, I, I count the calories that I consume. And then I run, as I said, I run 15 kilometers every day. But I mean... When I deliver my talks, it's part of my persona, and I feel like I'm more effective if I'm practicing what I preach. Uh, like I said, a healthy body is a healthy mind. I'm trying to develop uh, resilience uh, in, the pe- in the people. I mean, people, that's what happens. People approach me and they say, you know what? After uh, listening to your talk, I went for a run. And uh, the question is, do you want to become a product of your environment, or does your environment uh, become a product of you? And it's all about winning hearts and minds and, and showing leadership. And that starts uh, off by being able to uh, have control, which is Problem, easy. You need the, the willpower, man. I, I, I was, I was overweight, man. I know how delicious a chicken biryani is, man. Uh, but you have to be able to resist that, and that takes willpower. And um, you don't see results immediately. You know, you have to be patient. 
but it's really rewarding. Um, I mean, we have to be at the forefront. Muslims have to be at the forefront, and in every uh, in every way, you know, intellectually, physically, spiritually. And you want to know why um, we have fallen so far behind? It's because we're not because we're not following the Sunnah. You know, so next time you're on that treadmill, think about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and think about how you could be of service to our Ummah. Um, that's what inspires me when I'm on the treadmill, for example. Yeah, I did the conversion. So it's 200 for, for I had no idea what a kilogram is. So like 231 pounds of the conversion. Um, so yeah. let, let's, let's say, okay, so we have, let's say you have, you're a list, we're listening to this podcast right now. You're listening. You're like 250, 300 pounds. Where do you start? I think people like, you know, see you now. They look a picture like, like our, my mind is blown when I saw, cause I, I saw how you look like. Right, and you're running all these miles. What's the first step? Like, if someone hears this podcast and they're like 300 pounds, and they're, they're like, depressed and depressed because, like, you know, and they have a food addiction, you know, what do they do? Well, it's good to seek uh, advice from a healthcare professional, maybe a dietitian, um, and I would recommend that. But I mean, there are the stages of change, aren't there? You know, you have, you have pre-contemplation, you have contemplation because. Many people are in denial. I was in denial. I refused to believe that I was overweight. Um, but so it's kind of being brutally honest with yourself and then modifying your lifestyle. And it's not going to be easy. You know, you take it one day at a time, but you have to have a diary. For example, there was a, some research that was conducted uh, on people who lost uh, substantial weight. And uh, the recurrent theme was that they used to exercise one hour a day and they used to ha have a food diary as well. Um, because when you get older, you you can't get away with uh, what you used to eat when you were younger. Um, and you just think about it. If you're on the treadmill for an hour, you're probably going to expend about 750 calories. That's, a and that's an hour on the treadmill. Brother, you can eat 750 thought... calories in, in five minutes. I think before we even approach the treadmill phase and things like that, I think there needs to be uh, a conditioning process now just like you i i used to be morbidly obese i used to be you know cl close to where you were in, in in how much you weighed and i realized when i wanted to lose that weight and wanted to go to the gym it was yeah. an obsession it wasn't like you know something that is something i'm going to do passively you know or, or it's going to be in the back of my mind as i eat you know it was something that was kind of uh made concrete in my brain that you know this is something i need to to be aware of every day and and at every time i see or think about food i am thinking about how it's going to affect my body and i think that that kind of conditioning process is kind of overlooked with a lot of uh maybe you know dietitians and healthcare professionals that they need to work with their patients in in terms of solidifying that concept of, of why they should lose weight, whether it's vanity or whether it's healthcare related or, you know, whatever the reason may be, you need to make that patient obsessed about that, the idea of losing weight. And, and I wouldn't use the word obsessed because I, I, I know what you mean, but yeah. maybe the, the connotations but and the determination. Yeah, but, but we're know, just like, in, in the usage way, the, the common usage, you, you're, you're, um, you're focused on this more than anything else in your life. How's that? It's an active process. Definitely. I mean, it's an active process. You know, I mean, you can't be passive about this. And it's going to require uh, energy. And um, you have to be conscious of it as well, like constantly conscious of it, and it it can be quite tiring. Right. Um, and, and I think I think it would it should be something that you. I remember when when I was losing that weight, um, it was something. The first thing I got up in the morning is is I'm I'm cognizant about what I'm going to be putting in that, and this went on for a, a good year or so until I completely lost all all that weight. Um, yes. Since then, since then, I you know, have I gone up? Yeah, I've gone up maybe you know 20 pounds but n nothing nowhere near where i was at before so um and so it's always that battle like you know i mean for me it's always just uh, i'm not where i want to be right now i think i still need to lose uh about 20 pounds to where i want to be but uh i i th i think if we can first get 
people to condition their minds to to realize the enormous benefits of them losing that weight, they'll they'll naturally want to do it. Yeah, and I, I agree with you entirely. I think there is that kind of um, initial uh, stage, and I would go. I would I would actually use this word very seriously. It's it's a it's a jihad. Right. You're having with yourself, it's a struggle, you know, because you're trying to resist that temptation, which can be overwhelming. And not a lot of people have the willpower to do that. But if you're thinking short term sacrifice, long term gain, um, and if you if your mind is primed, um, and if your intentions if your intentions are, for example, it's you know the the strong Muslim is better than the weak Muslim, then may Allah you can even get hasanat, you can get ajr, you can get reward um, for your efforts. Um, so that would be my, my humble advice. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even right now, my waist size is like 33, right? And I'm telling my wife, this, this is not right. Like I'm looking at my love handles and I'm like, nope, this has to go. And, uh, I have to go to the gym. She's like, why are you going to the gym every day? I'm like, you don't understand if I don't, if I forget about it or if I don't put it as a priority, I end up, uh, it just, it, it goes down in my list of priorities and I end up forgetting about it. And six months down the line, I'm up 30 to 50 pounds. And I, without, in the blink of an eye, you end up wearing sweatpants and stretchy pants. And <laughs> before you know it, you have stretch marks and it's, it's horrible. And I think people, yeah, you, don't want that, you don't want that to happen. Yeah. I think the other important thing that Sims kind of alluded to is that everyone has a, Different. Everyone approaches food and exercise like it, different mentality is going to work for different people, right? Well, I, I'm so tired of hearing about how diets fail, and I feel like any diet will work if you are conditioned, yeah. if you're conditioning your mind right, and and you're realizing how important it is to stick to that diet and not allow yourself to fail. People will not fail. I right. remember when I was trying to lose weight, I was eating 800 calories a day. Yeah, and then I'd go on the I don't know, on the treadmill because I was too embarrassed to go to the gym. Yeah, because I was so big. Right, I would go on the on the treadmill for just walking on the treadmill for ninety minutes to uh, maybe sometimes two hours, just mm-hmm. watching TV while while walking on the treadmill. Right, right. And then eventually, you know, uh, as the weight fell off, you ended up going to the gym. You got a gym membership, and yeah. then you're like you're you're getting nice clothes, and then you see the benefits of. Of losing all that weight, and then you get all this, you know, confidence, and you, you know, you want to take on the world, right? I, I think, but I think you, the the what I'm trying to say is like that mindset worked for you. Like so people have to figure out what. So for me, I like extreme diets, in a sense that like, so I did something called Whole Thirty, which is like back in December. So I lost like four, but it was a hard set of rules that like, and you also it, to the point, but like like you, I was obsessed in a sense that you're cognizant of like. So I remember my friend invites me over. He uh, my, my friend just got married. Uh, he's Palestinian, and he just got married. He, his wife was over here, and he um he's like she's making mensaf, and you know mensaf for me is like Last Supper. If you if you're gonna put me on like firing squad death row, feed me mensaf before. That's like my last meal, right? So um, and he's like I'm, and I said I'm not gonna come. Uh, he's like, well, you can have the lamb. I'm like, yo, dude, I'm not even gonna be in an environment. I'm not even gonna like I can't watch out because that that fat yellow rice is like awesome. Like and I love that stuff and I can't eat that, like Beautiful. so I'm not gonna like watch you guys eat that because I can't have dairy I can't have MSG I can't have sugar or sugar substitutes and I dropped 14 pounds and like an inch and a half off my waist in the 30 days right, um and the thing go. is and you learn to like and then you're like and you as you're doing it, you're like you know what it's not that bad I can eat like this most of the time let me just set some new let me recalibrate how I eat going forward right. And then like and and I do stuff like so I do like CrossFit like probably two or three times a week right. People are like, why do you just why don't you just go to the gym and instead of paying all that I'm like cause like my mind I'm not one of those people that some people are like, well I can go to the gym and once I'm there I'll stay. I, I I'm the guy that I will go to the gym and like do like ten minutes on the bike and be like, oh I'm done. I don't feel like coming anymore. But with CrossFit I'm like once I'm there I'm locked in for an hour. You get what I'm saying? Like I'm not going anywhere because you like to do different types of exercises, or or like it's like the coach is pushing you through. Okay, right? You know, you got to figure out what works for you, how your mind is, and part of the I heard this on this another podcast is like you got to like, but the only way you do it is by experimentation. But once you find something that clicks, boom, just stay on it. Sure, that's that's a personalized approach, and I I advocate a personalized approach. You know what what works for some one person might not work for another, so. 
But and a lot yeah. of it's it's in, in, up in the brain how the mindset works. What you're talking about, Sam, yeah. is like what what because if you get your mind right to it, then that drives your action, right? You know, and and kind of go for there. Um, before we wrap up, Ahmed, um, are there any projects you're working on right now that you want to like tell the listeners about? Sure. So um, I'm fortunate enough to be working um, on a. I'm co-editing a textbook uh, with uh, the former. Uh, advisor to Barack Obama on Muslim mental health, uh, Professor Rania Awad. I understand that she was in your studio uh, moments ago. Yeah, yeah, right before um, your episode. That will be, uh, that will be published uh, hopefully uh, by Springer uh, this year. Though the co-editors are uh, John Petit in Harvard and Steve Mofik um, in Milwaukee. Uh, really excited about that. Uh, John is a Christian. Uh, Steve is a Jew, so um, it's, I think, an example of how um, interfaith uh, collaborations um, can really uh, be leveraged to challenge Islamophobia. Um, I'm also, uh, I'll be giving um, a lecture in Orlando this year, uh, the title of which is The Wounded World. So what we can do about healing our wounded world. Uh, breaking the ba- breaking down the barriers to care, challenging uh, violent extremism, um, combating Islamophobia. Uh, I've also made a movie with uh, filmmakers in the University of London, um, and we might be screening that at the in, in Milwaukee. If we're not if we're not screening it, then I might deliver my wounded healer uh, performance. So that would be next month, um, and I'll continue. Uh, with my mission to to reach out to as many people as possible and raise awareness of the importance of mental health. Right. Um, so I'm open to collaborations. And, and how, um, how can our listeners or, or people want to collaborate with you, reach out to you? Follow me, follow me on Twitter, uh, Ahmed, A-H-M-E-D. That's, uh, my handle is um, at Ahmed, A-H-M-E-D, underscore Hanker, H-A-N-K-I-R. And then you can just send me a personal message. Beautiful. Um, there, there was a there's a paper. I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this quote by Dr. Adam Hill, and this is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. He said that when he was honest, open, and proud about his mental health issues, many other people also wanted to be heard. Enough of us to start a cultural revolution. Beautiful. Wow. So, uh, and do you have anything on YouTube? Any of your performances? Sure, we've got. Um, I lectured in Cambridge University Islamic Society, so there is some footage of that. Um, I also did some work with the Royal College of Psychiatrists, trying to uh, encourage uh, medical students to consider a career in psychiatry. You just put my name in Google, you find a lot. I've got my website there as well. Cool. Uh, well, w- we'll put it up in our episode description and let our listeners click on it uh, on those links, make it easy sure. for them, so they don't even have to Google. Yeah. All right, yep. sounds good. Well, Jazakallah uh, Khair. Real, uh, real pleasure talking to you this afternoon or evening in in England. <laughs> yeah, it's approaching. It's approaching our show over here, so it's nighttime actually. The pleasure is all mine. It's all a right. blessing, and I hope we can uh, we can do this. Uh, we can build on this uh, on this synergy. Definitely, absolutely. You're a beautiful brother. All right. I, I definitely you. hope Love our you. listeners uh, click on the links and and listen to his lectures. Yeah, for our listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us. At the Mad Mamluks at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook. We need more likes. We've been stagnant. I know we, and the thing is, our listenership is growing. We know that, right? But like the freaking page. Yeah. <laughs> and tell your people to like the freaking page. And then we're on Instagram and leave us a five star review on iTunes. And tell your friends again to subscribe to us um, and, you know, spread the word for our special guest, Dr. Ahmed Hanker, and my co host, Sim. This is Mahin signing off. For the Mad Mamluks, Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum.